pleasure to be here this morning uh, to serve one final Sunday as a deacon at St. John's Church, a church that has loved me and supported me, and to whom I couldn't be more grateful for the time that I spent here. Um, I'm very thankful to God uh, for what he's done in my life to get me to the point where I have become a deacon in Christ's one holy Catholic Church. From today's Gospel, and Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever been in one of those situations where you try to explain something to someone and they completely misunderstand you. Like you're doing everything you can to explain something, but no matter what, you don't feel heard, you don't feel seen or understood. And this is the situation that Jesus finds himself in in today's Gospel lesson. Today's Gospel begins with Jesus predicting his death for the third time. And in case there was any question in the disciples' mind, Jesus makes it clear that his death is no accident. Instead, Jesus tells his disciples that he will be put to death and rise again so that all will be accomplished that was written about him. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was God's plan from the very beginning, just as the prophets of the Old Testament had predicted but, like they often do, the disciples have no idea what Jesus is talking about. And Luke wants to make this explicitly clear. And so he mentions it three times in verse 34. He says, And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. The disciples are so close to Jesus. They followed him every day of his ministry. And yet they don't see who he really is. And this should be comforting to us. Because in many ways, we're just like the disciples. We are so close to Jesus. We have been made one body with him by faith and baptism. And yet we struggle to understand him. To understand what he is really like. Luke then moves from the disciples to a blind beggar, who is referred to in the other Gospels as Bartimaeus, or blind Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus hears the crowds as he's begging on the side of the road and asks someone, what's going on? Someone from the crowd tells him that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Now Jesus' ministry has been going for some time at this point. So his reputation precedes him. This blind man has likely heard that Jesus has preached good news to the poor, healed the sick, and forgiven sins. And so he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You see, in a dramatic way, it is the blind man who sees who Jesus really is while the disciples still don't get it. And so he calls to Jesus. But someone in the crowd hears him and tries to quiet him. But he knows his desperate need for Jesus. And he cries out again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Luke tells us that Jesus stood, that he stopped in his tracks, and he listened to the voice of the man. And after the blind man is brought to him, Jesus asks him what he needs. He's a blind beggar. What, what else could he need? Jesus asks not because he doesn't know, but because he cares and he wants to listen. In St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus describes himself as gentle and lowly of heart. And in this passage, we see his gentleness on full display. Even though Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem, 
to die for the sins of the world and to rise again, and could have easily brushed this man off, he slows down and he listens to the needs of a blind beggar because he is gentle and lowly of heart. So Jesus responds to the request of the blind man. He speaks the word and the man is healed. And then Jesus tells him, Thy faith hath saved thee. And it's interesting because the word used here for saved can also mean healed. And I think Luke, who was a physician, intentionally used a word that can mean both. Jesus not only healed the man of his blindness, but Jesus forgave his sins and restored him to right relationship with God and his neighbor. And we see this clearly in the man's response to Jesus' work. Luke tells us that the man immediately followed Jesus, glorifying God. And now the question becomes, what is our takeaway from all of this? Well, as I already mentioned, like the disciples, we often don't get Jesus. We don't see him in his beauty and his majesty. And we also don't see him in the fullness of his mercy and grace. We struggle to realize that he truly is gentle and lowly of heart, and that he desires to heal us and make us whole. And both of these truths are especially important to think about as we enter the season of Lent. Now, Lent is a season of preparation, prayer, penitence, and almsgiving. And it is easy to think of all of these things as ways of earning brownie points with God, because it is hard for us to believe that He truly is gentle and lowly, as He says He is. And so we see Lent as this giant to-do list, and then we're filled with either pride or despair, depending on how well we keep our list. But Lent is really an invitation to become like the blind man, to realize our need, and to cry out to Jesus for mercy. The practices of Lent are not a way to try to change God's mind, because in Christ, God has made his mind up already. As Archbishop Michael Ramsey once said, God is Christ-like, and in him there is no unchristlikeness at all. Rather, the practices of Lent are a way for us to clear away everything that is distracting us, to open our eyes, and so that, like the blind man, we can truly see Jesus, and to trust him in faith, and in doing so, be saved. May it be so. Thanks be to God.